Hi, and thanks for joining us today. This is Chase Drum, AutoLine's West Coast correspondent. And today I'm joined by Bart Seidels. He's the Senior Director of Corporate and Business Development at Hubject. Thanks for joining us today, Bart. Thanks, Chase. Nice to be with you. Uh, it's great to have you on. I'm, I'm really excited to share what your company is working on. But can you just give us a quick uh, overview of what Hubject is for and the technology you're talking about today for those who might not be uh, familiar? Sure. So Hubject is a global company started in 2012. We are focusing in three main areas. One is interoperability. Um, we have a B2B platform that connects the what are they called the e-mobility service providers, the ones that have the connections to the EV drivers and then the charging networks. It allows them to roam to multiple networks. So it's the whole interoperability and ease of charging. The second area that Hubject focuses on is consulting. So helping companies uh, get into e-mobility. Uh, so we have a big consulting team that helps uh, uh, various different clients in, in the utility, in the retail, uh, and in all their conversion into kind of the e new e-mobility world. And the third area which we're focusing on is the, the plug and charge and focusing on the ISO 1511.8 standard, which has the use cases of this e plug and charge, being able to plug in the vehicle and charge with automatic authentication and um, authorization and smart charging and V2G. So those are, those are the three areas that we're focusing on with offices in Berlin, here in the United States in Los Angeles, and also in China. Yeah, and I'm, I'm honestly really excited about this technology because I think it's a thing that most people don't even think about if they've never driven an electric vehicle or maybe if they have, like you mentioned, just driven a Tesla. Um, especially if they're coming from driving an internal combustion engine, there's a lot that needs to be um, kind of simplified because, I mean, for a long time, it used to be if I was going to use a third-party charging network, I had to have the right RFID uh, and all sorts of fun little exactly. things you had to remember, which which is such a wild kind of experience. And so I think especially with how we're seeing, um, especially with just this past year, uh, electric vehicle adoption really starting to take off. This is going to just make it so much easier um, globally, because I know your team originally started in Europe, correct? Correct. Yeah. Headquarters are in Berlin, uh, started 2012, uh, obviously still have a very big presence over in Europe. Uh, have an office here in the United States and also in China. So it's really working on a whole global basis with the um, ISO 1511A, but also on a consulting and kind of interoperability side of, of connecting the, the drivers uh, and the um, CPOs and the OEMs. But we only work on a business to business side, but yeah, on a, on a global basis. Well, and there's, I think, a lot that people don't realize, especially when they are coming from that kind of gas station experience. You pull in, put in your credit card and fill up, uh, whereas your team has to work with, obviously, the utilities. It's it's really building, making sure the infrastructure is there for the gas station and then really having that strong software component. Um, one of the things I thought that's really interesting that to take that to the next level is some of the uh, vehicle to grid technology your company is working on. Can you share a little bit with us on that? Yeah, so I think I agree. I mean, that's where, uh, you know, kind of an EV charging, when we're looking at the in intelligence for easy charging, for somebody to be able to just plug in and charge up their vehicle as they would at kind of a fueling station, but even easier right now. But with uh, the technology, you're looking at smart charging and then, as you mentioned, vehicle to grid. So where that becomes really interesting is that the electric vehicle is is a, basically a mobile energy storage unit. Uh, and so when you have energy in the vehicle connected through a cable to the grid, you're then able to uh, put energy back into the grid or in a microgrid as and when it is needed. So it starts to become part of the whole distributed energy uh, solution uh, as a distributed energy resource, a DER. So you might have battery storage in a house. You have obviously renewable energy that has to be either consumed when it's generated or it has to be stored. And so now with uh, electric vehicles and as uh, electric vehicles get larger, like with fleets, with vans or with buses, this becomes an incredibly interesting part of that whole energy solution. Yeah, I think that's really going to really future proof the system from day one. Um, can you take a, just a step back for those um, who are I think there's a lot of really cool things that this has to do that people just don't take for granted. Um, 
I mean, I've had the unfortunate experience of a long time ago when I was using a gas station on a road trip, I ended up getting my credit card stolen. And it's just kind of one of those unfortunate things with the current status quo. But I, I think kind of doing more research, it looked like what was really cool is about some of the, not only the convenience, but the security that's built into the system to really mitigate that. So not only are you having a seamless experience, but uh, when it comes to actually just plugging in, but it, it's also making sure that it is much more secure. Is there anything else that you can kind of share with that side of it as far as the um, security goes? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The So the I think one of the key components uh, with this, the new kind of charging technology, like plug and charge and everything within 1511A, they have the different use cases, plug and charge being the first one that is really consumer uh, oriented and then smart charging and the V2G, which you just spoke about. But a key component of all this is the authentication. And this goes back to your, your point about uh, your credit card being stolen, is that there's no external identification required. So no RFID card, no credit card that is required because the technology uh, has it all integrated within. So the communication between the car and the charging station is the key component on the secure uh, secure communication. So that's done through these, what are called digital certificates or kind of digital keys that uh, manage the authentication to stop something like what you experience of having your details stolen. And it makes it then that seamless, uh, that seamless experience. But on top of that, Chase, what is I think really important is that you have the authentication aspect is important when you're connecting to the grid. So going back to your uh, vehicle to grid, the V to G experience, if you are going to be putting energy back into the grid, you want to make sure that that all parties can be trusted. You can trust that the you know that station, the EVSC, the charging station is a trusted party and the car and the energy going back in is going to happen. Because if you say you're going to put, you know, what, um, 100 kilowatts or whatever, a thousand kilowatts, from maybe a depot into the grid, you have to make sure that that is truly, you know, that you can trust that source. So 1511.8, uh, ISO 1511.8, uh, the standard is all about the authentication and trusting the stakeholders that are part of the communication process. That's awesome to hear. I, I'm kind of curious. I know you're doing a lot of uh, work currently with kind of commercial chargers and uh, that kind of stuff. But really, when you start adding the V2G side of it, that seems like a great opportunity for apartment complexes and condos and sort yeah. of scaling it to another level like that. Is that something that's kind of on your roadmap for future options? Oh, absolutely. I think for uh, in the industry. So Hubject is we don't do anything with hardware. We're on the, the software back inside value added services. Uh, you know, we consult through our consulting group. We help companies that are looking to, let's say, fleets to convert to into EV and how uh, this would really kind of uh, benefit their whole overall uh, systems of, you know, the, the V2G of using the energy, stored energy in their vehicles. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this is something that's important for, you know, um, multi-unit dwellings and apartment buildings of being able to offer them, uh, you know, um, electrification and options that might make their building more attractive than somebody else's down the road because they are offering um, secure uh, electric vehicle charging options and maybe even kind of fleets of vehicles that uh, add uh, bring into this whole another realm of e-mobility as alternative um, you know ownership of of cars so maybe a, an apartment building might have two or three vehicles that they offer to their residents rather than owning a vehicle and of course um, being electric is an even more attractive um, proposition for them. Yeah, and I think that's been one of the challenges for a lot of electric vehicle drivers is obviously what you guys are doing around uh, on the software side for just enabling a better charging experience when on the road is great. Uh, but one of the adoption issues we keep hearing about is really around apartment uh, and condo ownership. So it's just trying to streamline it. And I think what's great about this is it makes it easier to um, kind of track the cost to the charging uh, and also with the VDG option, then it becomes something that they can supplement uh, with income that way if they really wanted to. But uh, kind of going to this, since I, I think what's also really interesting is being on the software side, we mentioned, obviously, you're dealing with the charging infrastructure, you're dealing with the utilities. 
Uh, can you can you share bits of the work that you're working with on the OEM side and the actual auto manufacturers um, being the part that is the one actually plugging into these different services and one other layer of the software you have to build for? Sure. Uh, and this is a very critical part of the equation. <laughs> and I think that this is why, uh, you know, it's been a little bit slow in its uh, rollout. When I say it's the, the plug and charge is kind of the uh, the, the charging software um, advancement, but it's all really been dependent on the OEMs uh, because the the charging networks would have to make sure that their charging stations already in the ground are able to do it, which a lot of times is impossible. So there's a cost of building out a network. So it really depended on the OEMs making that commitment and bringing out cars that are plug and charge enabled. So um, we've worked with and uh, you know all the, the 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 car companies that are out and offering plug-in charge. The first one was uh, is the Porsche Taycan. Um, big leaders in this. So you know th this uh, movement started many years ago, almost a decade ago, with leaders like Daimler, uh, Siemens, uh, Bosch, uh, a lot of other players. VW all came into it, and it's only really this last year in 2020 where vehicles were out in the market offering plug-in charge. So the Porsche Taycan was the first one. Um, and then the biggest news I think really came along uh, where people raise eyebrows is when the Ford Mach-E announced that it was gonna be plug-in charge enabled. And they're doing that through the um, Electrify America network. We've been working very closely with Electrify, Electrify America and getting their system up and running. You know, great team there. Um, and also good support and working with uh, Green Lots uh, and, get, and helping them with their system. But going back to the, uh, and also and that's in the States and Europe, Ionity is one of the big networks, but going back to the OEMs, uh, you know, uh, VW has made a, a commitment with this, obviously with Porsche, uh, the, the Audi e-tron is, uh, is going to be plug and charge enabled. And they've also indicated that all their other uh, brands, so the VW brand, with the ID4 and three will be plug and charge enabled. I mean, those are gonna be coming out in I, this year, which is exciting. But the, I think the Mach-E from Ford is kind of was one of the big game changers to have more of a production vehicle. And when I asked them, I said, you know, what was the tipping point for them? And they said, a great customer experience. And they want something that's easy, that's secure, that's trusted. And I think that this, these are um, what they're looking at is everything to lower the barrier for people to buy an EV. You know, they're becoming, um, the charging is being resolved, the pricing is coming down, they're very, uh, you know, great looking cars, and also they save a lot of money on operating costs. And that's then on, you know, and then that's for kind of the passenger vehicle. But then moving into the, the fleet side, a lot of these companies are as well looking at um, electric vehicles beyond just the kind of legacy, a lot of other new car companies, passengers like Lucid is coming out. Um, you have other companies that are on the um, uh, on the, the commercial vehicle side that are looking at this as well, because they know that um, with 1511.8, you can do a lot of um, data transfer through the power line communications. That's the main way that the 1511.8 communication is managed. And so, you know, the OEMs have been a big driver in that. And I think because they are making, there's more vehicles that are out on the market, you're gonna see um, a kind of a shift with uh, the investment and um, ability for other uh, charging networks beyond the ones that I've kind of just mentioned, and both here in Europe, uh, excuse me, here in the States and over in Europe to want to implement 1511.8 to give that amazing uh, EV charging experience. Well, and that's great to hear, Bart. I've, I'm really excited to see how this is going to progress, especially for drivers right now. And then with the greater adoption of the VDG side of um, the, your technology, for anyone that might be watching, uh, maybe like an OEM or a utility that's interested in learning more, what would be the best way to either get a hold of you or learn more about Hubject and the technology? Well, uh, always go to our website at hubject.com, H-U-B-J-E-C-T.com. Uh, -E uh, and, uh, you know, on, we have a lot of resources there. Uh, and also, uh, you know, I, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to do that. Or my, we've got a great team members here in the U.S. and also over in Europe. 
And uh, you know, we're very excited about the the opportunities. You know, 20, 2020 was great. We saw many advances uh, as on, from the additional stakeholders embracing this. Um, and I think now there's just been a tidal shift in terms of auto OEMs committing to EV. A lot of legacy have uh, committed investments. You just see, read the headlines recently of GM uh, putting more money in and a lot of the, the legacy European automakers, but new ones as well, which is very exciting. I mean, you see all these headlines of Asian and US new auto OEMs. But yeah, please reach out, go to hubject.com, also reach out to me directly. And I'm yeah very interested to continue the conversation with anybody. Great, well, thanks Bart. We look forward to speak with you more soon and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Chase. It's a pleasure speaking with you.